Our scripture this morning is from the first letter of John in three different chapters, chapters 1, 2, and 4, and ask now that you hear God's word to you. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. the interlude. This is the interlude. All right. We sound good, though, don't we? Let's try that again. We're going to back up one verse and start our scripture over. Here again, God's word from the first letter of John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Moving to chapter 2, verse 8. Yet I am writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am in the light, while hating a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light, and in such a person there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates another believer is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know the way to go, because the darkness has brought blindness. And then in chapter 4, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. So by this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. So God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, 
but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. And those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this time last year, we as a church were embarking on a vision discernment process. On this Sunday last year, we were talking about the importance of vision. We focused on a particular verse on Proverbs that said, where there is no vision, the people perish. We were reminded of the uh, Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland who said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And the great American icon, Yogi Berra, who said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. The point is, without vision, without direction, we don't know where we're going. We don't know which road to take, and we may just end up in a place we would rather not be. Vision gives us direction. It gives us purpose. It unites us as a church. It motivates us, gives us goals and dreams, hope and energy. And so for all those reasons, vision is important. It is essential to who we are. So we embarked on this vision discernment process. And we asked God to give us a vision. We didn't go to some church consultant. We didn't um, get into some quick fix program or buy a book or even uh, consult with some business marketing guru. We simply asked God, give us a vision. And so for several weeks, through sermons, through small group studies, we looked at biblical visions, what their characteristics were, how they received visions, and what it meant to them, how it changed the lives of individuals and groups. And then little by little, parts of our vision came. Session created a a vision discernment team who met almost every week for months on end to pray, to ask, to seek from God on behalf of this church what our vision was, our God-given vision. And through dreams, through coincidences, I mean God incidences, through lots and lots of prayer, little by little it came. Until finally we were able to, to put all the pieces together and receive of a full vision, a complete vision. And yet, somehow we had to put that into words, and that that was a difficult next step to do. Once you feel something that is so big and so grand and so beyond description, how do you how do you put that into words, much less a little, you know, ten word or less statement that you can memorize? But we did. So our vision statement became and is abiding in Christ, sent to grow, shine, and love. So here we are a year later, having sought and received a vision from God and a statement that that to the best of our human ability captures that, expresses that. But now what? Now we have to figure out what that means for us as a church. How does that unite us? How does that give us direction? How does that help us make decisions about the future? We've already tried to do some um, evaluation of our structure and our and our staffing and and trying to make some changes that better align with that God-given vision. 
But this whole upcoming church year is going to be about how we live into that vision. And our, our focus will be different parts of that vision throughout the church year. And so we begin with the first word, which is abide, abiding. And the, the quintessential passage for that word is John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. And so for the next six weeks, we will be focusing on that in our sermons, in our worship, as in our small groups, in our Sunday schools, in Wednesday evening and adult chow. And we'll be trying to figure out, okay, how do we abide and therefore grow in Christ? In November and December, we're going to focus on shine. Jesus is the light of the world. How do we let that light shine through us in this world? And then in, in Lent, we'll focus on love. Love on a cross. Love as we serve our homeless neighbors through winter shelter. Abiding in Christ, sent to grow, shine, and love. So as we begin with that first word, abide, we'll be hearing that a lot in the next couple months. So what does that mean? Because I don't know about you, I don't hear the word abide a whole lot in everyday language. What does it mean to abide? Well, as I was looking at the original language, the Greek word is meno. It appears 118 times in scripture, but it's translated in different ways. It's not always translated as abide. It's, it's translated also as remain, uh, stay, dwell, live, continue on. So trying to get a sense of this word abide and what it means. It's not just to exist. And we all know, if you know a second language or have ever tried to study a second language, you'll know that you, you can't always just substitute one word for another and get the full understanding of what it means. So I wanted to learn more about this word abide. And as I read more, I, I began to realize there's a resilience to this word. There is a strength in the word abide. The picture that, or the description, the visual picture that I read about abide helped me so much to understand what it means. It meant thinking of a shipwrecked sailor in the middle of a storm who found this, this small island and huddled in a cave, and he's wet and he's cold. He doesn't know if he'll be rescued. He's physically in danger, and yet, in the midst of that situation, he has a sense of peace. Abide means that no matter the exterior circumstances, no matter the situations you find yourself in in life, your inner disposition is not change. It's a keep on keeping on. It's a resiliency. It's a, it's staying true to oneself no matter what happens in life. That's what abide signifies at its core. Not just to exist, not just to live, but to live in a way that keeps true to who you are, to that inner peace we find through the vine, despite the circumstances of life. That's what meno, abide, means. And of course, John 15 gives us such a rich metaphor for abide, and we'll be hearing a lot about that in the next six weeks. But today's scripture also tells us about Abide. In John's first letter, he says that if we abide in Christ, if we are rooted in Christ, surrender our will, center ourselves on Christ, then Christ will abide in us. We will survive these storms of life with this intact 
sense of peace because of that abiding. I was reminded this week of the, um, the devotional, Our Daily Bread. One of our session members sent it out to all of session because this scripture was also our focus in our uh, Thursday evening meeting that we had. And I was reminded through that devotional that as Jesus' beloved disciple John grew older, his teaching increasingly focused on one topic, the love of God. And there's an old legend that says that one of John's disciples came up to him and said something to the effect of, why don't you talk about anything else? Why is it always love, love, love? And John replied, because there isn't anything else. God is love, plain and simple. There isn't anything else to talk about. And so 1 John emphasizes that this love is not some abstract concept. It is a passion, a passion that is expressed in a particular action. And we know that action was God sending Jesus to live among us, love incarnate, and to die for us. And so God continues to show us love through the life-giving presence of Jesus, through the gift and witness of the Holy Spirit, so that if we should ever question God's love, the Holy Spirit confirms within us that we are God's beloved. And God's love doesn't depend on our initiative, doesn't depend on our worthiness. We don't have to clean up our act in order for God to love us. We don't have to come to some standard of lovability it is sheer, pure gift, whether we deserve it or not. And quite frankly, who could ever deserve the amazing, immeasurable love of God in Jesus Christ? Love comes from God. It's not a human achievement. It's not just an emotion. It's an action. It's a way in which we live. And we learn to love from God, just like children learn to love from their parents. We learn to love from the example that God has given us. And so as we live in that love, abide in that love, then naturally that flows through us out into the world as we treat and interact with other people. But John says the reverse is also true. If you say that you love God, but then you, you hate your brother or sister, then you're a liar. So part of how we live necessarily reflects how well we are abiding in God and God in us. The love we extend mirrors the love that God has shown us. And so in a way, we kind of open ourselves up as a conduit through which God's love flows out into the world. In a very real way, we represent God by the power of the Holy Spirit into the ordinary lives of ordinary people. God's love is made real through us in this world. Now, a few of us would probably dispute John's notions about love. I think a few of us would argue that God is love or that we ought to love one another. But then we come to passages that kind of make us stop and think. For me, that was verse 18. Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. There is no fear in love, and perfect love casts out fear. Now, no doubt, John is talking about our relationship with God, how we don't need to fear God if we know that love, because we know God loves us and wants what's best for us. 
But if perfect love casts out fear, then it casts out all fear. Fear of this world and fear in this world. Because the problem is, if you think about it, there's a lot of fear in this world. And there's a lot of fear in us. It starts as kids. We're afraid of the dark. We're afraid of the, the monsters that are under our bed or in our closets. But as we grow, the monsters grow too. And it was on a day like today, 15 years ago, that the monsters we fear became all too real. Where were you when the world stopped turning? As Alan Jackson put it in his song, I'm sure almost all of us could pinpoint the emotion, the day, the feeling, the people we were with when we first heard about those attacks on September 11th. So maybe a more important question to ask is, what did you do on the day the world stopped turning? There was a lot of love that was expressed that day and on the weeks to come. I know for myself, I kept my original schedule of serving home communions to shut-in members because I was determined that hate and violence was not going to detract from my original plan to love that day. A lot of people called and gathered with family and friends to support, to love. A lot of people went to church that day to look for answers. A lot of people prayed that day, some for the first time in a very long time. Some people sent donations of money, bottled water, feeling so helpless. What can we do to help? Some packed up their cars and headed toward the scene again, to offer whatever support or help they could. There was a lot of love expressed that day and in the weeks following, not the least of which was New York's first responders who loved and risked, and many of them gave their life to help and be there with others. But there was also a lot of fear that day and in the weeks that followed. Arab Americans were killed because people were angry and they wanted someone to blame and they saw the first person that was wearing a turban on their head and killed them. Mosques were desecrated. Gun sales rose drastically. Firing ranges saw a 20% increase in business in that time. Prejudice was renewed. There was also fear in those days. Let your faith be bigger than your fears. Fear didn't begin with 9-11, and it doesn't end with it. There's a lot of fear in this world. We fear loss. We fear betrayal. We fear pain. We fear death. We fear harm to our loved ones. We fear losing what we have, what we own. And fear is supported in our society. It's used. Fear is used to sell security systems, political candidates, and insurance. Fear is prevalent in our society. It gives us caution. It makes us stop. It helps us protect ourselves from the danger that we sense. To help preserve us and our families. It can also paralyze us. It elicits that basic fight or flight response. When you're in danger, 
when you're at risk. You either need to run or you need to fight the enemy. Which is probably why the great preacher William Sloan Coffin, when he preached on this passage, said that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is fear. Think about that. Can you, can you love someone that you fear? Or at least love them in a biblical way, an agape kind of love, the kind of love that God showed us that we are called to live in this world? Is that why John writes that perfect love casts out fear? Because it's kind of like light and darkness. They can't exist in the same exact moment. Fear divides. Love unites. Fear looks out for self. Love looks out for others. Fear brings about the fruit of distrust and suspicion and hatred, resentment. Love brings tenderness and compassion and sacrifice. Love and fear can't coexist the same moment. And I was thinking about that perfect love, that perfect love casts out fear. None of us is perfect, and we know that, and that's why there's love and fear all mixed inside of us. But God's love is perfect. Jesus' love is perfect. Can you think of a time that Jesus was fearful? That he was afraid? I think the closest I can even come to thinking about that is the Garden of Gethsemane, and even then, I'm not sure that was fear that motivated him. See, Jesus had that perfect love, and I don't see how fear was a part of his life. Perfect love casts out fear. We don't have that perfect love, but maybe that's our prayer. Maybe that's the direction this vision is helping to move us in. That we pray our love is bigger than our fear. That we pray that our love will increase and our fear will decrease. I have over my doorway in my office here a little plaque that says, Let your faith be bigger than your fears. And maybe that's the direction this vision moves us in. We can't make ourselves not be afraid. It is a human, natural response and emotion. But we can pray. We can abide. And I believe the more that we are abiding in the love of God, the less we will fear. And if it's true for us individually, it's just as true for us as a church body. That we are to model love not fear. The love of God expresses itself in community as the body of Christ together. And so as we as a church continue to abide in that love, perfect love will cast out any fear that exists. We know the church is a human institution as well as the spiritual body of Christ. We know that we are not perfect. But again, this vision unites us and moves us in the direction of abiding. And in that abiding, our fear is cast aside. Abiding in Christ, it's the first part of our vision. Abiding. It's a sense of, of peace and of rootedness in the midst of the storms that we face. Abiding is a sense of God's love that casts out the fears of this world. So let your love be bigger than your fears. Faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest is and always will be love.